unlocking automated bioinformatics for large-scale healthcare. Today, I will tell you the story about curative healthcare and biotechnology startup that has scaled from zero to millions of SARS-CoV-2 tests resulted in the United States in a matter of months. I will tell you about how Curative has scaled up the sample collection process in multiple axes, how we have set up a bioinformatics pipeline and AWS infrastructure to analyze COVID sequencing data for healthcare monitoring. And finally, I'll give an example of the type of outputs one can get from this. So the agenda, very simply, three sections. First, we start out with three main axes in which Curative has scaled the collection process to even allow us to be able to analyze uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic on a large scale. Second, we'll go over the biomedics pipeline and the infrastructure. And third, the uh, insights, as I just mentioned before. So something about me, very quickly. My background is in RNA-seq. I started out with the uh, ion torrent, actually, for those of you who remember it. Did small RNA-seq analysis there moved into the wet lab, did some CRISPR-Cas9, which was amazing, but I very quickly ran back to bioinformatics. It's the much funner part of the equation, if you ask me. After that, I moved to Stanford, kind of combined these skills of CRISPR-Cas and RNA and DNA-seq analysis, analyzing tens of thousands of COVID, uh, sorry, CRISPR-Cas mutations at a time in a single uh, sequencing experiment. Nowadays, I'm a biotechnology consultant, consultant curative in the next generation sequencing department uh, as an independent consultant. So, what are the three main dimensions that curative has scaled in to allow to rapidly extend our SARS CoV 2 response? First, curative has made it supremely easy to set up your testing location anywhere in the country. And here we have the three main ways shapes or forms in which Curative has done this. So first, we have the kiosks slash vans. Very simple, you can set it up in any parking lot, can handle about 250 to 300 tests a day, anywhere in the country. For higher population density areas, we had drive throughs that would typically handle over 6,000 tests a day. Uh, and we have indoor facilities that could handle up to 500 tests a day in uh, let's say areas where it's more difficult to set up a uh, localized fan. Second, Curative has developed their own internal software to enable the uh, scheduling of hundred thousands of tests um, at a time. So at the peak, Curative could handle a hundred thousand daily users at a time for scheduling their uh, appointments. Uh, we had an internal limbs that allowed us to track capacity and samples in real time across the whole uh, workflow. And this has also enabled Curative to keep their eye on the ball and ensure 24 hour to 48 hour turnaround time in almost any place in the country. And of course, this wouldn't be possible without setting up high throughput, high capacity and highly automated laboratories. So these are the three ones we have. Uh, they totaled about 300,000 uh, maximum capacity of SARS-CoV-2 testing uh, daily. So you can imagine we could process a lot of data and that we have. Curative to date has resulted more than 30 million SARS-CoV-2 tests to the public across the United States. And we can see that uh, it all started out around March 2020 where uh, Curative was able to scale up to a million tests within five months, and then 10 million tests in another five months, steadily increasing to over 30 million. Unfortunately, the uh, animation here doesn't work, but let's just say that um, it's everywhere. <laughs> Always lovely on uh, conferences. So what did we set up on our bioinformatics side to do SARS-CoV-2 sequencing analysis? For us, there were three main components. First, we wanted to make it simple. We didn't want to deal with too many bells and whistles. We just wanted it to get the job done. Second, we wanted it to be fast turnaround time. And third, we wanted to make sure that anybody could run this on our team. So very simple, next flow pipeline. 
taking BCL files, converting them to FastQ, taking out the primers, the adapters, uh, aligning against the Wuhan reference genome, creating a consensus sequence, and then determining the lineage with pangolin. And this is really a big picture overview of the infrastructure we set up to kind of automate and scale this. So we set up a cron tab job on an Illumina sequencer that will constantly push data to AWS simple storage surface. And once we had all the data in there, this would trigger a workflow through AWS Lambda. It would start a uh, next flow main process through AWS batch, after which we were running the worker nodes again through batch, shuttling data back and forth from AWS S3. And really, this is all it takes to set up uh, an automated and scalable system. And really, the benefits to us have been we could process thousands of genomes at a time. Uh, runtime was usually under one hour, uh, for, regardless of demand. It's cost efficient, and most of all, we had minimal uh, manual labor, so we could focus on doing science, building more Nextflow pipelines, and even building more products. <laughs> So we did have a technology stack behind this to really manage the whole thing. So I'll be going over this step by step. Uh, first of all, we defined all of our infrastructure scope through HashiCorp, Terraform, Terraground, and Packer. For those of you who are not aware of what this is, you basically define your infrastructure in software, and you're able to generate the infrastructure to your software in the cloud, which enables it to be reproducible, transparent, auditable, and flexible. And this has really allowed us to make sure that we can quickly iterate in our infrastructure part. We set this up with very simple security. We set up a virtual private cloud and made sure to restrict secrets and permissions as much as possible through IAM. So even if an attacker would get through, you don't have to worry too much about the consequences if their IAM role doesn't permit it. <laughs> Third. Uh, the container orchestration, this is what I alluded to before. We were using Nextflow and AWS Batch, and we were using the Elastic Container Registry from AWS, so we don't get rate limited by Docker Hub. Uh, set up the automations with AWS Lambda, so we're using event-driven architectures uh, for uh, automation. And for those of you who don't, don't know, this simply said means if event A happens, run code B. So in our example, if an RTA complete.txt file comes over from your Illumina sequence on S3, that indicates you can start your pipeline and we run this serverlessly. So we don't have to worry about maintaining a service to process these requests. And finally, we were using CloudWatch and the billing console to really drill down on where are costs generated across the pipeline. And together with the infrastructure as code, we're able to tag every piece of our infrastructure and we're able to precisely determine where price performance can be tuned. So what's an example from an insight that we can generate from this data? To date, Curative has sequenced over 33,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes, most of which are deposited in public databases like GIS-8. And here on the left, we can see an example graph that we can generate from this. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage of samples at that point in time, and on the x-axis, we have two quarters of uh, pandemic. And what we can see is, uh, in this specific window of time, it starts out with BA1, which is about over 90% of the samples at the start of that year, and it gradually gets taken over by BA2, after which we see a lot of different subvariants of BA2 pop up, but then we see there is a star there, it's BA2.12.1, that is rapidly taking over BA2. And what's interesting to see is that the rate at which it's taking over uh, is, BA2 is much faster than uh, BA2 took over BA1, and this is something we all know and remember from the pandemic, right? We were constantly dealing with more and more infectious variants, and I think it's really cool to be able to see that in an actual graph. But having more metadata here also allows us to kind of drill down on the more localized level. So here we look at the same data from the plot on the left. Uh, colors are not matched, by the way, so be careful of that. Uh, we have four different locations, California, DC, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And we can really see how the wave develops uh, commonly, but also differently across these regions. So we can see the uh, 
conversion from BA1 to BA2 happens everywhere, right? We, we can very clearly see that trend. But for example, the BA2.12.1, the big yellow part on the left graph, uh, the third row in the right graph, we can see develops quite distinctly in different regions. So for example, we can see in DC and Pennsylvania, we had a more um, sustained increase of this variant over time. Whereas in California and Texas, we kind of see an absence and it just explodes out of nowhere. And it's really cool to be able to see all these localized trends as well and being able to report back to the local health authorities and the communities and helping them to uh, inform their decision making. And that was it. And with that, I would like to thank all the people that made this possible. I could never fit everybody in here. So these are a lot of names. Uh, but there's many more people also on the software side, on the lab side, and probably many more departments that are missing out. So please don't feel bad if I do. And uh, with that, I would like to take questions. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, we'll try and get back on track. So one, just one question again. Um, Simran asks, what are your practices for version control of your bioinformatics pipeline? So version control, uh, mainly Git and GitHub, honestly. And uh, again, what I mentioned is using the uh, Terraform or infrastructure as code has really helped us to do this not only for the software, but also how we run our analysis, right? So I think that was a crucial component of our version control there as well. Do you go back and rerun data when you make updates to your analysis pipeline? Uh, could you repeat the question? Do you go back and rerun previous data if you make changes to your analysis? Um, if it's a significant change that would impact the results, yes, absolutely. And having everything version controlled makes it quite easy to do so.